Hi, I'm Maddie Scary. I'm the director of the Poppy Jasper International Film Festival. And today we are with Kevin Rubio, who is a screenplay writer and producer. Drew Massey, who is a puppeteer, writer, director, actor, voiceover. Um, and Andy Frody, who is also a screenplay writer. Thanks, you guys, for all being here today. And um, I, I, I kind of just like, can we just start off a little bit, you guys each telling us a little bit about yourself and your career. Um, let's start with uh, Kevin Rubio. Uh, yeah, 30, 30 years uh, in the industry, uh, mainly in animation. You can see my stuff if you have HBO Max. Uh, DC is probably the easiest uh, to, to watch it. Uh, currently, as everybody else is um, uh, uh, figuring out the pandemic and how to do a, a show uh, during during a lockdown, and uh, uh, hope hope new to, to to get that rolling again. <laughs> All right. Well, how about you, Drew? Uh, let's see. I started in '89. So what's that? Thirty-two years. Wow. Um, <clears throat> that's when I had my first pro uh, professional puppet gig, uh, and I've been a puppeteer the entire time. And then I got into writing and, uh, been trying, I've been pitching shows forever and finally, uh, got one, two series and Yay! I've been in Canada the past six months, um, uh, shooting something called the barbarian and the troll for Nickelodeon, where I was a co-creator and exec producer and uh co-star so and when is it on drew excited about that april 2nd <laughs> every friday i think thereafter it premieres right after uh camp coral so seven o'clock uh, yeah, so yeah uh, it's uh we're at 7 30 camp coral's at seven we're, we're immediately following it so clearly the the network likes it because that's a kind it's of a cherry pop. position that's in good schedule. yeah so so check about, it out. Yeah, I'm excited. I'm excited. Uh, how about you, Andy? Um, yeah, I've been I've been doing working in the industry for about 20 years. Um, God, yeah, I guess so. I got I went to USC and and then I graduated and got um, into um, right. That was right when reality shows were blowing up. So I I was a producer on reality shows for about 12 years, which I. You know, I learned a lot, but I didn't, I didn't really like the content. So I, I then finally about, um, gosh, I guess seven or eight years ago, I just said, okay, I'm going to just cold turkey stop that and, and start writing and, and go for it. And then um, I managed to have a couple things optioned and and a couple things are in the pipeline and, and they're mostly features. Uh, but then I've been supporting myself for about five or six years writing, so which is kind of always my dream. So it's been, it's been great. It's great. That's great. That's one of the things that you guys all have in common is writing. And can, so can we talk a little bit about uh, the process that you guys have each have gone through um, when you write a script? What what do you do? What what do you do next? How do you get uh, people's interest in um, how do you sell? How do you sell a script? <laughs> Pure showmanship. Yeah. yeah. Persistence. I mean, if you want to talk about crafting a script that's i mean that the two different games uh -huh. you know um it and and also it, it depends at least from from my experience you know was to if you're a staff writer or you're a if it's television a staff writer or if you're an independent uh uh for hire uh mm -hmm. versus you know just somebody just who wants to sit down and 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 plunk out a script um mm -hmm. so uh, uh selling a script is a is an entire different animal altogether and it has to do with a lot with persistence timing luck uh <laughs> the market well how, how have you made it kevin i mean you've written for um quite a few animated shows like how how did that come about um well it, it uh, most of my work sprung from my uh independent uh, short uh, troops back in 1997 uh, and you know that kind of became a calling card which then just allowed me access and uh, in entry into 
into the industry uh, proved that I could write. Mm -hmm. uh, so, I mean, and Drew, you tell me if this is different or Andy with you as far as the uh, shows, because I know that having, I've also worked with, I worked with Ken Mock, uh, who's a reality producer. And even, you know, those reality shows, uh, they, they still have scripts. And at least for, oh, yeah. for a show, when I'm on staff, uh, you know, you usually, you have, you know, the writers sitting around a table and you do what's called breaking a story and your head writer or showrunner uh, has a basic sense of, of structure or maybe it's uh, just an idea or a line. So-and-so, you know, is trapped in this place and that's all you have to go on and you're, you, 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 you arrive early in the morning and, uh, you know, they have the, the craft services there with the coffee and you sit in front of a big blank whiteboard and... For the first two hours, you procrastinate and talk about what you did last night and what are you going to order for lunch and did you see that thing on the internet? And then you realize that it's an hour before lunch, so you better order lunch and you argue for another half hour about that. And then when lunch arrives, you realize you've only done one scene uh, and so you better hurry up and start breaking the axe and you just start throwing stuff up on a board. And usually the writer's assistant or intern uh, is there, you know, jotting everything down. And, uh, you, you know, you, you, you have, if it's a, if it's a, a half hour show uh, comedy, it's usually a two act structure. Mm -hmm. uh, sometimes it's a three act. Uh, typically uh, network television operates on a five act structure or a seven act structure, which is five oh. acts and a, a teaser and a prologue uh and you know you're you you, you fill it yeah. i mean is that uh, uh, with, with with what the characters do and you do uh, little beats character beats story beats drew and you know any any difference with you and um uh, trolls and the barbarian and the troll that's pretty much what it was like i mean uh you know it was we d started during the pandemic we shot our pilot um three well, like a week before the lockdown and so we did all of our writing over zoom i still have not to this day met my writers face to face um but it was the same thing like our head writer eileen had a whiteboard at her house in sherman oaks and uh and she just um yeah would we would we would break the story and do exactly what we said procrastinate and then when we were on a total caffeine high that's when all the best ideas would come zooming into our heads and we'd um pop all those down but that's yeah that's about right but we had we had like a three act we have three different um uh breaks so um yeah anyway yeah that's about right so, so it seems like that doesn't it like there's a there's almost a like three quarters of the day you get like a little done and then there's a kind of like a crescendo where it all falls together, right? Like, oh no, that should go in this story and that should go in this episode. And then, yeah. then you leave There's, like the last two hours of the day when you're with other people, I think are like the best two hours. Yeah, there's a lot to be said for incubation. And I think most of that is incubation. Like they always talk about like, oh, John Hughes wrote Breakfast Club in a weekend. I'm like, yeah, but I guarantee you he thought about it for about five years beforehand. <laughs> and that was probably the first draft. Post-lunch period. Yeah. yeah. As, as far as for anybody that's, that's listening, when, when I guess when we talk about structure, uh, most Western films uh, fall under uh, three-act structure, beginning, middle, end, and what you'll you'll often hear writers throw out, you know, the, this big pompous term is Aristotle's poetics, which is basically just that. It's just a structure, beginning, middle, end. Uh, everything with a, with a forward momentum. And uh, usually it starts with a, with a character or a situation and a goal. And the object is to throw as many objects in front of Obstacles. that goal yeah. or that character. Uh, on his way to achieving what he or she ultimately wants to do. And with 
if you're doing it right, each each scene is either propelling the story forward or revealing something about the character that you want. And if, if you're if you're really doing it right, it's doing both at the same time. And in in some cases, when you're a really good writer, it's it, it it's turning you in a different direction um, uh, that is surprising yet logical. Uh, and and typically, Act One is the setup uh, where you you get your you know who who are your characters. What is your goal? What is your problem? What are the obstacles? Uh, act two is starting out on that and getting a lot of things thrown in uh, in front of you that that make it really hard. And with the with the final beat in act two being the character or the situation's lowest point. And then act three is overcoming that and bringing everything around uh to finally resolve the problem or the goal that the character has uh, did i did i miss anything uh fellow writers <laughs> oh, that's it. That's no i mean the, you know, the great thing about that is there are just so many uh permutations of that you know if, mm -hmm. if there if there is a a problem the character doesn't even have to overcome it sometimes it's just acceptance but it's a uh, it's a way that you know reveals something important about the character and I, I guess the whole, the premise is that, you know, everybody, you really find out about people in times of crisis. So <laughs> it's kind of, kind of get to squish them a little bit to see what they're made of. Um, yeah. But yeah. Yeah, that's really good. When you start writing, it's easy. I think it's really easy to forget. Um, I'm assuming some of these people watching this are, are just beginning their writing for like, it's easy to forget that, um, you know, people come, drama is conflict. And I feel like a lot of scripts I read from people who haven't been doing this for a while, don't, they don't, they're like, nobody wants to watch everyone get along. You know, you gotta have obstacles and problems. Like I, I find a lot of people do that. You, you gotta have conflict. Yeah, to that end though, I've seen a lot of shows attack that in what I personally think is uh, kind of a terrible way. And I see people start out just writing just people being dicks to each other for no reason. Uh, and that's not really conflict. That is, because uh, it can also be really satisfying seeing people who do work together, trying to solve a problem together. That is also conflict, but it doesn't just involve uh, page after page of snarky dialogue, which I personally find very tiring. <laughs> you, you know, one of the things that, that I, I, I found helpful early on uh, and this is for, for first time writers is, you know, taking a, a, a movie that you like very well and, and know maybe backwards and forwards and using that as an exercise and breaking it down and summarizing it as to, you know, okay, well, what is each scene? And then, you know, and then trying to dis dissect those and figure out what that character has done and, uh, you know, like Raiders of the Lost Ark, which I'm sure everybody knows, you know, as, as a, what, you know, that opening scene reveals so much about who this person is, the, the character of, of, of Indiana Jones. And, and it doesn't, it doesn't even set up what the story is, but what it, what it does, it, it reveals who is this main character, you know, obviously a nefarious person who will, will, will take chances, put other people in harm's way, put himself in harm's way, you know, uh, just by his look. You know, if you try to imagine, you know, in the screenplay, how he was described appearing out of the shadows, how would you write that? And how, how would you do it concisely, you know? Um, uh, and, and just taking that, the, the Zucker brothers didn't know how to write a screenplay when they did Airplane. Uh, they'd never written a, a full length feature script. They'd just done sketch comedy. Uh, so they literally wrote beat for beat the movie Zero Hour and and just use that as their as their template. And and I think, you know, Drew, you being an, an artist, you know, a lot of people, they say, well, you know, I can't I can't draw. And I say, well, you know, it's, it's like anything else. It's practice and muscle memory and studying and you know when all of us first started to just write 
letters of the alphabet, you know, we sat there and we traced over a letter and then did it a hundred times across a page, getting our, our hands used to that muscle memory. And it's kind of the same thing with writing. If you take a, a good script and you break it down and you start to see the, you know, the, 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 the similarities in what is good, uh, yeah, there are patterns in everything. And I, I think, I know when I started out, I was, you know, reluctant to copy. I mean, whether it was drawing or writing or anything. And, and there, you know, there are an infinite number of uh, adornments you can put on any structure. Like I wouldn't shy away from doing exactly what you say. Study what works. Don't shy away from it. Um, and in writing comedy, if anybody out there uh, is tempted to take improv class, even over Zoom, I hear it works. Um, but improv is is great because I I kind of liken uh, writing to an improv game called New Choice, which is if you write something and it kind of sucks, just new choice yourself. Just keep doing that and come up with a new thing. Um, I, it, writing is very very slow improv. <laughs> yeah. and, well, I mean, but even improv, there's a structure. You know, there yeah, are absolutely there are there are rules and there are things that you, you you it seems like you're coming up on the spur of the moment, but there is a there is a learned structure to how that kind of thing is done. Precisely. And it's so satisfying when you can find the game and you find what works and what's funny. And it could have been done a billion times before, but you know, this time it's done with your character in your voice. So it's automatically different. Uh, to circle back to what I, I had uh, uh, mentioned earlier, Raiders of the Lost Ark, there's a gag in there where Tope, the Nazi spy, uh, brings out what you think is a set of nunchucks and then it turns into a, a coat hanger. That is a gag that Spielberg did for the second time. The first time he did it was with Christopher Lee in 1941. Um, uh, and it didn't work. <laughs> so, <laughs> so he he did it. He did it again. <laughs> so there you go. Steal from yourself if you have stuff and scripts you've written that you like. Yeah. yeah. Use it. So okay. one of the nice things too about writing is uh, kind of going off what you were saying, Drew, about improv. That it being this like slow improv, or that was Kevin. I'm sorry. One of you. I said. It, um, is is I, I always tell people like writing is rewriting. I think people a lot of times, you know, and it's an, I didn't invent that. It's a cliche expression, but but um, people think like, oh, I wrote this and I typed the end, so it's done, and it's it's not really how it works. You got to just go over it over and over and over and over again, and that's where the improv skills really come in because after a while, especially with comedy, I think. You know, you're you're not thinking about what the character's motivations are anymore. You're not thinking about what the scene has to do anymore. You've already settled all that. So then you can really just that's my favorite part, because then you can just play. You know what I mean? You can just, well, what about this line? And you know, you can have alternates and 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 just kind of have a list and figure out which one really fits and plays better. So it's important to spend time, um, time rewriting. I think a lot of people are like, oh, I just that's it, it's done, it's got, you know, I got it done. And it's like, no, 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 you can, you can make this so much better just by forcing yourself to sit in the chair in front. Yeah, no, that's, that's great advice. And I, I always recommend that if you're, you, that, that even writing bad stuff is useful. And if sure. you, sometimes I would like, I'll like write something and then put it in a drawer for two weeks and then come back to it and pretend somebody else had written it. And if it's <laughs> crap, I'd be like, ugh what was this guy doing? I can make this way better. And then you do like, yeah. you know, yeah. <laughs> there, 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 that, and that is, that is more than often the case is that, you know, geez, that, and so, yeah, it is important just to step back after, yes, you've done it, you've accomplished it, but it ain't done. Step back, take a few days, take a week, then go back and look it over. And, you know, Sometimes you get this thing like, hey, this is pretty good. Uh, but more often than not, it's like, good God, that's crap. Uh, and <laughs> and make no mistake about this. And I don't, I don't say this to deter anybody. I just want people to be prepared for the reality. If it's your first time doing it, 99 times out of 100, it's going to suck. And, and that's okay. 
<laughs> yeah, it is. And, 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 you know, and oh. your second one, probably your and and your third and your fourth but eventually you keep at it and like anything you get to you 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 see the pitfalls you start to see the mistakes and you and you you get better that's just it's like everything you know? also rely on friends if you have friends that you trust uh that will not just shit all over your stuff to do it uh, yeah. well, I guess then they're not friends, but your yeah, good friends, like have them read it, have them give you tips, have them, you know, uh, tell you what they responded to, what they liked about it, what they didn't like about it. And it's really valuable having some sort of sounding board. Cause if you're in an echo chamber all by yourself, you know, you can often like just become in love with a certain part of the script that honestly doesn't work and you won't realize it. Sometimes you need and somebody else to tell you that. And look, and be prepared. Oh, you, 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 go, I'm sorry, Andrew, go ahead. No, 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 go ahead. I was just going to say, you know, you got to learn to take criticism. It, you know, it's, it, it, it'll happen. I, I had a valuable lesson in, in film school. What my first film, uh, uh, somebody else cut, you know, and I sat there as he took my, my seven minute opus and, <laughs> You know, and turned it into a, a tight 240. <laughs> and, <laughs> and, I, and I was like, but, but that is a, it's got to go, man. It doesn't belong. It's not, it's, it's not hampering the story. And you, you, you have to just toughen up and get a thick skin and know, hey, more ideas, they come. Don't, that's the thing. Whatever your ideas are, don't save them you know put them all in if you're like if you're writing a pilot you go oh but this is for this is going to be for episode six no screw that put it in uh you know if it, do, do your best ideas uh you'll come up with more i promise you <laughs> yep on 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 taking criticism i think you have a couple of really good points one thing going back real quick to what drew said i think it's really important is to have people read your script and the frustrating thing is you, what you'll find is that if you give it to seven people, you'll get seven very different interpretations if they really give you thought. And that's okay because people watch movies and TV all the time and take their own things out of it. But in terms of what you should do with those notes, I find if three or four people give you the same note at the same point or three or four or five people, like then that, you know, you might not like, you don't have to follow every, you don't have to follow every um, note that you get, but if like most people give you this note, there's probably something there. And so that's kind of how I judge on because you know you have to you have to be true to your own voice. Somebody might give you a note because they just don't like that the character did that. So it's and it's like well that's who this person is. But if everybody says I'm confused here, you know even if they give you different solutions, you know okay the problem is right here. I'm, something is not working here. Yeah, yeah, I think I, I think uh, I think fellow USC uh, uh, alum uh, Bob Zemeckis. I, I I think I'm attributing to him, and I hope I'm getting the quote right. Says one person has a, pr a problem with it, it's an opinion. Uh, yeah. If two people have a problem with it, it's coincidence. If three people have a problem with it, it's a problem. <laughs> yeah, I I, uh, I learned a lot from. Um, I mean, my partner on Barbarian and the Troll, uh, Mike Mitchell, who I co-created the show with, he's really good at, he directed Trolls and has done a ton of writing and, and really good directing. He always um, is adamant about hammering the clarity. If it's not clear, because uh, Andrew, you were saying something about, um, you know, if people are confused and that's really important to not confuse people. You can have the most clever script in the world that nobody gets. And it's useless because if you don't communicate your idea, what's the point? So, um, you know, I always find it really important if people are confused, how do you make your idea more understandable? Because I think the onus is on you as a writer to really communicate what you're trying to say and not the other way around. It's like, well, you just don't get me. Well, then you're not doing your job. <laughs> yeah. It's always your problem. Yeah. Yep. To be clear. And, and you you have to you 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 have to in some cases cater to the reader um uh i mean there there are some people that go off and just write prose uh 
and, but you know that's like Sorkin or Brian K. Vaughn is one of my favorites to read uh, I like I like reading his scripts he's very familiar with his stuff but he's Brian K. Vaughn and he can do that um, uh, or uh, Akiva Goldsmith uh, I I was uh, up for one of the films he had written and it was god awful but it read beautifully I I understood every character. I knew where everything was going. I never once, and I don't know if, if, you've, if you've had this, Andy or Drew, it's like, you know, you'll be reading along something and then you got to flip back to three pages and go, wait, who is this guy? Yeah. Um, yeah. Never the case with Akiva. You know, yeah. you just, I just knew, uh, you know, page one, who everybody was. It was so clear. And I was like, this is executive proof because yeah. well and that's what it's all about that's yeah. what it's all about because their job if some junior executive their job is to say no yeah. so that's what like like any it's like whenever i read a script with typos like anything that they can any anytime you give some some junior executive an excuse to just throw it out you you've done that's what's going to happen so if they're confused if they have to flip back yeah clarity is is number one Clarity and simplicity. Sometimes you can be absolutely brilliant by just doing the simplest thing. And if it reads in a way that nobody else has done, it's then you've done it. You cracked it. Uh, I, uh, just here, I'm, I'm, I'm speaking, speaking of Brian K. Vaughn here, I'm going to pull up. I've got, I actually have one of his scripts on my desk right now because I am, I'm currently writing something and I like looking at his prose to go, okay, how did he do this? And this is page one. Um, uh, scene one, I'm just going to read you the opening scene. Ex exterior, medieval England twilight. A crowd of screaming peasants charges over the rolling green hills of 16th century Britain. But just when you start to worry that this is going to be a shitty historical drama, we push in close on one of these moaning peasants to reveal worms crawling through the flesh of its remaining corpsed face. Oh, neat. <laughs> These marauding farmhands are actually the army of the undead. <laughs> and, and what's the script for? What movie is that for, Kevin? This is an unproduced script called Round Table. Okay. Yeah. But cool. God, Where King Arthur fights zombies. I love it. Yeah. I'm in already. <laughs> uh, yeah. Brian K. Vaughn, Shane Black, same thing. Like Shane Black. Just, yeah. Oh, yeah. Just so readable. It's, 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 it's a pulp novel. It's so good. Have you guys and, ever seen? And I, it? So I, I try to keep. Yeah, sorry. No, no, I like another good example of how to do that kind of stuff is um, the guys who write the Bond movies. Have you ever read any of their their scripts? Like the way they do action is just incredible. It's like so fast. Excuse me, guys. Um, uh, it's a great example for how to write action and, and get that Bond charm in there. And, and it's just you can almost read. I heard somebody told me like it's good if you can almost read straight down. You know what I mean? Like if it's so clear and concise and funny that you're not even really aware of going left to right, you're just kind of looking down the page. Oh um, yeah. That's all about, and that's all about like how sparse the writing is, but just perfectly placed little little pieces. So, so what are some of your um, favorite writers, Andrew? Um, Akiva's pretty good. Akiva Goldsmith. I, I mean, like of all time, um, uh, probably Patty Chayefsky wrote fantastic network is one of my favorite movies um Patty Chansky, uh, i think david Kev has written some great stuff um especially earlier in his career i think i i, I love uh carlito's way is one of my favorite screenplays it's a good, good script yeah, sure it's awesome. all about eve <laughs> yeah yeah go <laughs> Yeah, those are those are a couple of my favorite. I mean, I love I love The Sopranos. I'm a huge fan of David Simon's. David Chase wrote The Sopranos. David Simon wrote The Wire, and uh, recently The Deuce. Fantastic writers, I think. Um, uh, his name escapes me. Uh, Vince Gilligan. I think Breaking Bad and Better Call Saul mm -hmm. are just fantastic writing. Just terrific character studies. Um, God, who else? That's all I got right now. <laughs> I'll think of more. I'll think of more. <laughs> Sorkin, is, Sorkin is good, you know. I, he's he's got a very good style. He he has a very specific voice, mm -hmm. um, which I think works in some movies and others. I, I, I 
lends itself better. I mean, but who, I don't know if you can criticize him. He's fantastic. But, but uh, I, de I definitely, I feel like he is one of the biggest auteur writers we have right now in terms of, it's, you know, it's unmistakably him writing that movie. Yeah, he's got a great master class, by the way, if anybody's, I heard. that's a good, good, yeah. uh, good primer on his writing. It's pretty cool. What about you, Drew? Who, who, who are the writers that um, you're inspired by? I don't know. I mean, I watch so much TV and I try to, you know, pinpoint who writes my favorite episodes. You know, like when I watch Community, I always go back and, you know, I just, I was like, Carrie Dornetto, she wrote that, the episode where Britta uh, has a lesbian friend and this mistake. Anyway, it's just like, I, I go through and identify my funny, the funniest episodes of whatever. And I've been watching My Name is Earl and Greg Garcia. Just, I am always really impressed when people write a, a solid pilot. Uh, the pilot for My Name is Earl was like fantastic. Great and yeah. it's, yeah, yeah, just great, just so clear, like 100%. He knew those characters right off the bat and just nailed them on page. Um, oh, uh, so, yeah. Uh, uh, Amy, Amy and Daniel Palladino for, uh, oh, Amy Sherman Palladino. Marvelous yeah. Mrs. Maisel. Jesus. Oh, yeah. That, yeah. that that they 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 make me want to quit. <laughs> it's like, yeah, uh, that's it. Yeah. I'm not gonna. I'm never gonna be that good. <laughs> yeah, you know something's good when you walk out of it and you're just like, I could never do that. Like, how do they do that? It, that's the sign, the symbol of a. a you just saw something great. Yeah. <laughs> so so Kevin, you talked about how tr how troops propelled your you know, your career. Um, Drew, what would you consider to be uh, what propelled, propelled you into screenwriting and what was that thing that, that, that connected you to the industry? I mean, I've really written just uh, as a function of like tr trying to create shows and sell shows because um, I'm pretty TV based and, um, you know, sold a couple of pilots to Nickelodeon way back when um and that was that was funny because my uh creative partner on that paul rugg who did uh freakazoid and i we actually pitched it via a, a radio play that we did like we wrote the script hmm. based on how it would play in the room and then we recorded all of it with all the music and then we're like imagine this show click <laughs> And, uh, and they're like, that's hilarious and brilliant. We can totally imagine animation going on in our heads. So, you know, I, I always come to things through sort of an obtuse angle. Um, yeah, I don't know, wait, what was the question? <laughs> so what was that thing that, cause you, cause uh, the, the thing, that thing that uh, part of your career that propelled you into getting attention um, for your screenwriting? You know, Kevin did troops, and so pe the eyes were on him, and 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 he was able to get people to look at his screen screen um, screenplays. What is mm. the that you know? Because you can't just walk into a studio and say I have a script, or you can't just you know email it to somebody. You have to have that connection, and and how do you how do you get to writing something and getting it to the right person? For me, it's all through uh, people and connections. And, um, you know, like my my first writing job was through um, Paul. We had done our, you know, pilots together and he hired me on um, the Peabody and Sherman show. So I was a staff writer there and sat in, broke stories and came up with gags and stuff. And that was a lot of fun. Um, but yeah, I mean, I haven't had any, really like the Barbarian and the Troll is going to be my calling card <laughs> till till now it's just been like the hard slog of um yeah i don't know how i get pitch meetings uh pure <laughs> showmanship as i said like really half the time your enthusiasm for your own projects mm -hmm. can um get you pretty far you know if you if you but if you believe like i'm a big believer in confidence and commitment that's kind of all you need um <laughs> earned or not um if you're really committed to what you're selling and what your story is and you can formulate a pitch 
pitch it around, pitch it to everybody, you know, um, and if you are, and like Kevin said, persistence, it counts for a lot. It's, so those three things, confidence, commitment, never, persistence. It's never the same. You, there's, there's no set path. There's no rules. Everybody gets into this business a different way. Yeah. You, I'm, I, I couldn't have, couldn't have done it the same way drew did it i'm sure anthony couldn't have done it the same way i did it ultimately yeah it's what drew said it's just commitment persistence you know don't be a dick uh which i, I should follow more but uh, <laughs> that's that's just it you you just gotta keep keep going at it there are there are fellowships and there are internships that the studios uh do uh, you can you can do an internet search on you know uh, on on studios and, and writing programs uh, that the the television academy has one uh, the motion picture academy has one all of the networks uh, have a writing program mm -hmm. um, uh, you you, uh, you can look at the uh, the WGA the Writers Guild of America um, uh, uh, for for you know questions about uh, uh, writing fellowships and you know submit uh, uh, Ron, Ron Howard has one uh, uh, called impact uh, you know which is open source you where you can pitch you know so th those are those are inlets um, but it really yeah but th that's a great point that nobody comes at it the same way or or gets in really the same way um, so you know, do what works, be opportunistic, um, meet people, make friends with people. Um, Writing and, groups, you know, uh, and, uh, a, a mutual friend of ours, uh, Charlotte Fullerton, who's a showrunner. Uh, she, she formed a writing group for up and coming writers called Charlotte's Dream Killers, where she took, you know, kids and and would would critique scripts and they would meet every week and sometimes charlotte would post it but sometimes they took it upon themselves to to do it and uh, i don't know did you speak at that one time drew i know i did mm -mm. but Not you yet. know uh and and i know at least three of the people that were in that writing group that are now professional writers uh, obviously they had the benefit of of a of a working showrunner to to you know give them the uh the kind of uh, the prop the door open and and give them some connections but uh you know they they had they had the uh uh, uh the, the scripts and 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 the the talent to to back it up and keep working you know so one thing that i wish people had told me going off what you're saying is um like 20 years ago i wish somebody had told me that People make movies and TV shows with their buddies. They want to make shows with their friends. It's not a meritocracy. Who you know is super important. So I wish if I could go back, I would have told myself, like, take whatever job you can get that's as close to the kinds of people that are making the sorts of things you want to make. Because they're going to they're gonna teach you how to do it. And it's just what you're saying, Kevin, like you're going to become friends with them. They're going to read your scripts. They're going to tell you to do this or that or take this here or there. And I'll call the guy in advance or the, the woman so you know, like, so they know you're coming and they'll take you seriously. And it's, so it's really important to, to work with the kinds of people that are doing the sorts of projects you want to do, whether that's TV or movies or whatever, or reality show, whatever it is you want to get into. Um, yeah. Very clickish. It's too, it's too big an industry and there's too little, there are too few opportunities to work. For it to just be like, let's read all these scripts and put and make the best one. It's kind of like who can get it on whose desk and, and get the you know attention. the people and the people that are thriving and that are rising that rise to the top are people that uh, always are keeping their 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 minds open and their mouths shut and and learning. You know, because you every every day I I, I know know that you know even people who have been in this business as long as like scorsese you know is interested in learning new things about cinema and uh so 
I, I know that there are people that, you know, they come out of, out of film schools or, you know, that oh, I've been doing this thing, you know, I've, I've been doing my YouTube channel now for 10 years. You know, I, I got this down pat, you know, it, it, that attitude doesn't get you anywhere. It's always, you know, those people that are curious and, and, and willing to learn new things that I like, you know, hanging around and, and sharing with. Absolutely. And, you know, since I've been big in the puppet world, it's maybe especially true. I mean, I think it's true throughout entertainment, but, you know, a lot of the people who come to the world of puppetry and wanting to do, you know, what I do are just start out as fans. I mean, I certainly did. I started watching the Muppet Show and I love the Dark Crystal and all the hens and stuff. And, you know, I was just a bit super puppet geek, which so I kind of knew and of movies in general. And I knew I wanted to study it and I was just a big fan. If you're not, if you're not enthusiastic about it, then give up now. <laughs> you have to, I think you have to really love it, to do it. And uh, cause it can be hard, you know? I mean, also as a working actor, auditions, the whole audition process, I've been on both sides, it's, it's not fun. You, you wanna see people succeed and it's, it's really demoralizing. <laughs> <laughs> so you have to love that aspect of it. Um, writing maybe even more, although they're not criticizing your looks, so that's better. <laughs> we were we were actually we looking for really young something. Drew Massey. Yeah. What's that? I was just saying, if they, if they are, if they're criticizing your looks as a writer, you've done something really wrong. Like, <laughs> that's, right, that's right. We're really messed up. Like, not only is you focus more on your writing. Ugly. <laughs> Joe, Joe Esterhaus would never have made it. Right. <laughs> I'm oh, sorry, Joe. Joe. Joe's a beautiful man. Joe, you're beautiful. Joe, you're a beautiful man. <laughs> um. So, An Andy, um, can you talk a little bit about what inspired what inspires you to write? What? How, where do you find your stories and? Um, you know, you have, you have, there is, you have a big script in the, in the works right now. And, and you want, if you want to talk a little bit about that or um, just sort of what, what, what inspires you to write? Um, you know, it's all kinds of things. I mean, like going off what these guys were just saying, um, I think you, I think you kind of have to write. Like you, it's almost like you don't have a choice. Like, it's not always fun, but you're just, you just you have to do it. So in terms of what inspires me for stories, just anything and every, everything that I come across that seems interesting. And a lot of times it'll just come from all sorts of different things. It'll just kind of fall together. Um, and um, I like, I like, I like um, more grounded stuff. I like a lot of true stories. I like satire. So I look for things where I, I see a lot of potential to make something that's, kind of strangely common, hysterical or absurd. Um, one of the reasons I, so I wrote this thing, you were mentioning, I, I wrote this movie about the making of The Godfather, which um, I basically wrote to try to get an agent. I wrote it as a, a stunt script. So I didn't have any representatives and I had just started writing again after like not doing it for seven years. And so I, somebody gave me a really good piece of advice, which was every weekend, you know, writer or uh, sorry, agents and producers and stuff, they bring home a pile of scripts. They're never going to get through all of them. And if you want to get read, you're like, it's, it behooves you to write something that they're, you know they're already interested in. And what he was like, what about a movie? Like, you know, movie people, one thing you know these people love is movies because that's the industry they work in. And so I was a, I'm a huge Godfather fan and I already knew a lot about it. And I thought, well, I'll write like a, I'll do a satire of what it was like. And also I had just kind of broken away at the time from um, working on reality shows, which are really, really frustrating to work on for a bunch of reasons I won't get into. But um, the whole artist journey and the process of trying to create something and being met head on with, because the, basically the script I wrote is about Francis Ford Coppola, who was very much an artist, artist and auteur. And then Robert Evans, who's kind of this famous producer for just being like, put naked girls in it, you know, and shoot them up, you know, do these, you know, very, very like, and people will come. And so you're talking about two people that are, we're just going to go 
head to head like you would not believe. And um, and we all think, I think we all kind of fantasize in our frustrations about them. It almost have been so good back in the day when they were making something great like The Godfather. And so what I kind of enjoyed reading more and more about it was that it was a miserable experience for everyone involved. A couple of to this day kind of cringes talking about it, but at the same time through this conflict came this work of art that, you know, was like one of the most highly regarded feature films of all time, certainly of American cinema. And so I thought, well, that's something that kind of, you know, gives me inspiration. I had just gone through this very frustrating experience and, um, and uh, I think everything is frustrating. All these things we're trying to make, you know, we're, we're just, you know, this constant, constant conflict and butting heads and, you know, but you have to just in, in, endure and persevere and, and something great can come out of fighting all those little fights, picking the right battles and, and fighting. And, um, and so that's kind of where I got inspired to do that work. Uh, and then, you know, other things come up. I wrote this other thing that after I, my, my, uh, my mom was really sick for a long time and I, I moved home and, and we, we got her better. And then just out of kind of reconnecting with my mother, I sort of got, to, I wrote this other thing about a true story. And, and so things just kind of come up in life, I think, that kind of influence you. Or things you read. Uh, somebody told me that, you know, uh, if there's no input, there's no output. And that's really, was I read a lot, um, watch a lot, you know, like you were saying, Drew, like that's our, that's our, um, uh, uh, that's our business. It's kind of funny, but like watching TV and movies, I'm like, well, this is me working. <laughs> yeah. You know, you love it. It's like, you got to see what's out there. You got to see what's new and, and, and get the wheels spinning. Yeah. And yeah. Kevin, you write, that's, that's wonderful. Andy, thanks for sharing all that too. Cause um, y- you know, that, that movie is uh, going places and it's going to be, I'm really excited for you. So congrats. We'll <laughs> yeah. Fingers crossed. Yeah. It's tough. You know, it's really tough right now because features are um, like the Met. I'm sure you guys know, like the metric has just totally changed. Oh yeah. It's a theater. I mean, like, you know, it's, it's, nobody really knows like how, how can we guarantee a return on our investment? Because right now there are no ticket sales. So that's all up in the air too. It's a good time to be in, doing a TV show. <laughs> well, yeah, and television yeah. definitely changed, t- taken off, you know, um, Kevin, can you talk a little bit about, you know, you, you write a lot of, um, uh, you do a lot of animated shows and a lot of superhero shows. And can you talk a little bit about how how you how you write for for those? Your, your... Um, well, it, it when you're dealing with stuff that's so well known, uh, and there's been so many things that have been written about them, like uh, you know, writing for uh, uh, the Justice League. You know, it, it's always it it's it, it's even worse than a Simpsons did it. You know, because you, you when you're talking about things like Superman, uh, you know, you you have 80 years to contend with, and so in in those cases, it's just you have to you you have to come with a lot of ideas and be prepared that they're all just going to get knocked down. Uh, I know that I submitted, I think, 15 premises for a Justice League, you know, and there's a no, no. And, and one, uh, uh, the, the, the most recent uh, 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 incarnation, Justice League action, uh, uh, my, uh, the, one of the premises that, that got traction was uh, basically game night at the watchtower where everybody's sitting around and playing monopoly and based on who the characters were, it's like, how would, who would cheat, who would hoard cash, you know, who would, uh, who would follow the rules exactly. Um, and that, you know, talk about rewriting and going off in different directions that, that evolved into, uh, a, a, uh, a sparring match between Wonder Woman and uh, and Supergirl, uh, the, you know, and and, and it, it just you got you you start off with you know because it was going to be okay. Well, 
yes, this, we don't want Superman. Let's say it's Super Super Supergirl, and then they say, you know, we're we're a little we're a little guy heavy, uh, so let's just do an all female, you know, one. And so you just say, okay, well, who are the who who are the uh, who are the female characters that you can use? Of which there are many, but you know, then uh, you know, based on a premise, what do you what do you do? Uh, uh, and and you know you you, <laughs> you keep throwing stuff up on a board until it sticks. Right. Um, That's great because, like you said, we've seen those those people save the world now for eighty years in yeah. many, many ways. So it's like, how do you how do you make it different? How do you how do you show something else? Character revelation, like you guys were saying earlier. Yeah. My my late uh, friend Dwayne McDuffie was always good at that, especially with Superman. And the last Superman piece he did was uh, All Star Superman. He adapted Grant Morrison's uh, comic book into the animated feature, and there are some things in there where, you know, when people point out, "Wow, that's that's like my favorite part," and it's like that's not even from Grant, that's from Dwayne, you know. And he could always just find something new about about that character, uh, which is kind of inspiring because you when you think oh it's all been done and it's like no nah, this guy found something a different take a different way in that that still made sense uh when uh i was working on green lantern and uh i think in 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 as far as show position i think it was episode 20 and you know, uh, I don't know how many writers' rooms you guys have been in, but you know, we walk in with the in the in Warner Brothers. Often, whatever room you're working in has you know art and concept stuff up all over the walls, and you know, on this one whiteboard that spans the entire length of one wall, you had every episode and where it was in production, and you know, you had your outlines and your beats and stuff. And I'm going down the line, and then I see the one that we've come in to work on today. And all it says is the difficult one. Oh, and, <laughs> and I'm like, oh, great. And it, 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 the, the idea came from Bruce Tim, where it initially was just going to be a, a cold open where uh, the lanterns, all of the lanterns, uh, power rings uh run out of power and like what happens you know with that and and bruce said that's an episode you know what what happens when your ring runs out of power and you can't recharge it and so that was that that was our task that and that was the premise that we walked in on and uh and we had uh from our showrunner jim krieg we knew where we started because we were it was a continuous story so we were picking up you know here are the characters this is where they were in the last episode and uh and this is why their power has run out and then you know go from there and and you had to you know i think i think we were the ones that devised okay when you're when your battery goes low you know what's the first thing to go what's the second thing to go what's the last thing to go and uh you know, the last is, is like atmospheric and, and environmental. And so uh, we thought, well, okay, let's put them, if, 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 if environmental stability is the last thing to go, let's put them on a planet with no oxygen. And how do you handle that? You know, now you can't breathe. <laughs> uh, and uh, the, the, the second to the last thing to go was uh, 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 galactic uh, translator. And so now you have you have a human. I can't remember what Kilowog and uh, Razor were, but you have basically three people that you all of a sudden realize, oh, they don't speak the same language, and uh, and how do you communicate? And so those things became, you know, uh, fight for survival. Got it, you know, got to got to get our, our suits charged, but in the or rings charged. But you know, while we're trying to get the rings charged, we have to learn to communicate and oh yeah we have to learn how to breathe <laughs> and not die so those were the you know the, the the obstacles that we threw in the way to try to overcome you know you know what's a great lesson in that story i really like that what you were just saying and i feel like a lot of people should hear should should take from that as well 
I've been in some rooms. I mostly write by myself, but I've been in some rooms and a lot of writers and I, I love writers, but I, I hate to say this. And I think you guys will probably know what I mean. A lot of writers will come in and find out they've been assigned the difficult one yeah. and be super pouty about it. Yeah. But what I like about what you're saying is that you, you took, you know, something that everybody knew was really hard and crushed it. And that's, that's the way you want to be when you're working with a group of people. Like that's the attitude you want to, because before, you know, that that's good. Your stock, I'm sure, really rose even higher at, as a result of that. Because like yeah. a lot a lot of writers, sadly, a lot of people will just be like, oh, they gave me a crappy one. And, <laughs> and you've got to kind of be the, you know, just in terms of the actual business, you know, in terms of working and making friends, you got to be the guy who's like, put me in, coach. I, you know, let me, that's how you get an opportunity. You know, if they, if they stick you on the 20th episode. I mean, I know you've been working for a long time, but if you're a young person, just get mm -hmm. in the 20 second episode. We don't really know what to do with it. Nobody can crack it. Be that person who cracks it. Mm -hmm. And to that end, uh, my friend Dan Milano, who created Greg the Bunny, uh, oh, he did a show called Glitch Text for Netflix. And he said, when we were looking for writers for The Barbarian and the Troll, um, very wisely, he's like, you know, when you're looking for writers, you can find people who come up with a perfect idea but you know eh. but even if you find somebody who routinely spits out the worst ideas ever that also has incredible value because just like writing a piece of crap putting it in, in a drawer and coming back to it that can often force you into the right solution by having the absolute wrong solution <laughs> it's i mean it's weird it's like uh, do the opposite of what you know that was just put out so um so to to, to that end uh if you want to do that like don't be shy about putting yourself in there and even spitting out the worst ideas ever because they might actually bear fruit at some point well and sometimes it's just process of elimination right Sometimes you'll Absolutely. be in a really weird situation. You've painted yourself into a corner. You know there's a way out. And you just write that one, like, kind of hinge scene, like, over and over. And you're like, God, it took me a week, but I finally found the right way to way to make it work. Yeah. You know, I think it's better sometimes to write a bad scene than to write no scene. You know what I mean? Like, I think you can... You can you 100%. Know, what do they call it? The, um, oh, God, what is that saying? The... Uh, paralysis of analysis like if you just sit there and stare at it you'll never get anywhere but if you just type something out no that's not it no that's not it no that's not it and you'll get to the right thing yeah Definitely. sometimes you just have to exercise the bad ideas out of your head <laughs> yeah yeah exactly yeah new choice yourself slow improv like i was saying yeah yeah um so can you all just talk about a little bit what you're working on now what's new for you um, Kevin, I, you know, as, 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 as we were doing this, I pulled up the script I'm working on right now and I, and I, and I'm reading the opening and I'm going, God, that's just too fucking long and wordy. I gotta read, I gotta redo this. <laughs> <laughs> hey, you got it out of your system. Wait a second. I said, I don't, I don't get to the, I don't get to the reveal until the 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 top of page two i should i can i can condense this into a half of a page <laughs> but there you go pretend somebody uh, else wrote it <laughs> so <laughs> uh, i'm uh i i've got a, a a disney plus uh thing i'm i'm pushing right now which is Again, hard during the pandemic trying because nobody's in the office and the only reason this this just transpired yesterday it turns out uh it, it goes to show you you never know where where paths are going to lead uh an old colleague of mine that i've known for 30 years is now in charge of feature films at disney plus and it was it just, <laughs> so i just I, 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 I dialed his cell phone and said hey here's an idea <laughs> i've been trying to get it into disney plus but i don't know there's there's my agent can't find anybody and and he said oh that's because we eliminated that entire line of people uh so every 
have, they 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 started out doing Disney Plus like like a network, and they realized no, nah, that's that's slowing things down. So now every single department is just responsible for providing content. So there's there's no person. It's just like Disney features provides Disney stuff. Features. Marvel provides Marvel stuff. You know, and and so yeah, I I I threw something at him and. And I'm I'm waiting. <laughs> Roger, I know you have a, a new show coming out, but um, what what else are you are you working on? Um, I'm developing a couple of uh, new ideas. One of them I'm going to pitch to uh, the Jim Henson Company. They have a a system for animating in real time um, CG characters. They used it for Sid the Science Kid, so I'm going to pitch them a show using that system. Um, and, uh, yeah, I'm just, I'm just writing different stuff to, to pitch and, uh, chewing my nails off, waiting for the premiere of my show. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you know, we're all very close to the vest here. We're not gonna, we, we, we won't get into specifics. So, so we, we apologize to, to, to the audience out there that wants to know, I mean, I'll tell you about a failed piece. <laughs> <laughs> Here's something I worked on that never went anywhere. <laughs> oh yeah, but, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I usually keep those and recycle them. <laughs> yeah, because it means it was it, it was like either ahead of its time or behind, it, but it'll come around again. So just yeah. wait and it'll all be good. So I don't know. <laughs> I see that happen a lot. Well, that's a good. That's an interesting point. What do you guys think about? I'm sorry, not to change this, but real quick, like. I just found that when you try to chase the market, it's totally a waste of time. Like one of the things I've recently learned in the last few years is just just write what you want to write and kind of wait for it to be relevant. I think that, I mean, I have something I wrote like seven years ago now that's finally yeah. to action. And yeah, absolutely. I think I think if if you're, if I mean, I think the smart way to do it is have a portfolio of stuff that you're passionate about that's all updatable. So you have a core idea that's great. And then, you know, if references are outdated or whatever, when you end up pitching it, just fix those. But it's, it's mostly there. Yeah, I mean, it, it, I, I tend to, it seems like I'm, I'm always like 10, 10 years ahead <laughs> when I'm doing stuff. Uh, and to chase, to chase whatever is popular right now, a script takes so long to produce and just date. I mean, the average is seven years. So, I mean, whatever you're chasing now, unless you're J.J. Abrams, it's not like, hey, we need this next week, you know, and they're going to green light it in a week. It's just fruitless. Um, uh, the, 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 the only thing that right, right now, the same Disney Plus piece that I'm trying to, to push was the result of a need. Somebody said, we need something that can be shot during a lockdown. And so, uh, it, but it just so happens that this thing can still be shot without the lockdown. It makes it a little more difficult, but you know, this, it was, it was designed, you know, to be minimal crew, you know, uh, minimal cast. Uh, and, and if the lockdown is lifted and I have a bigger crew and a bigger cast, well, Hey, that's good too. <laughs> but yeah, chasing, chasing was popular. Uh, rarely very very rarely works i mean uh you know, to justice league the original cut i think is proof of that <laughs> but you have to have the the fortitude i think right to, in the belief in yourself to resist because i feel like your people are always telling you to do that like that's something that i'm like you, your agents and your uh what's the next um you know parasite or the, you know the next it's like well that's a habit I mean, by the time I get it ready, it, you know, it, it's just impossible to, to do that. Yeah, there, I think- We're looking for that Barton lot. Fink feel. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> I, think, I think there's a lot into also being aware of what's out there, what's being pitched, what people are looking at, and uh, being really into the idea of counter-programming. I mean, I think one of the reasons The Barbarian and the Troll uh, got sold is because you know, my partner, Mike, who has done all these animated movies, he's like, I've seen what's out there. It's all CG. It's all kind of the same. This is not 
because it's puppets done in a way that you haven't really seen before. So they're like, oh, interesting. And you can shoot it during a pandemic and we can do it quickly. I was like, yeah, it's like infinitely quicker than animation, but gives you a kind of the same feel. So, but it was funny, even, even when we were pitching it, it was like, uh, they're like, so it's all puppets. Mm -hmm. And it's not for preschool. Nope. <laughs> yeah, we don't. We don't really know what you're doing. I guess we should just give you money to do a pilot. And we're like, yes, that's the idea. Do that. Perfect. So we ha we actually had to do the pilot to even, uh, you know, clue people into what we were <laughs> what we were pitching in the first place. For real, because they're like, do you have any examples of what you're trying to do? And we're like, no, we've been trying to get something like this made for like 25 years. So you'll be the first. <laughs> So Andy, what are you working on now? It's the same as he's got. I mean, just just developing more things. I had um I had a a, a feature um uh that was really unfortunately was really close to shooting when the pandemic kind of hit. And so I'm trying to kind of get that back up and running in terms of like what I'm trying to get going in terms of that's already written. And then I just really, uh, I'm just finishing up another uh, feature right now, like a heist movie. And um, just developing and taking meetings and I think for a mini series, I'm trying to get someone to pay me to write. And <laughs> just, you know, you always gotta be, you guys know, you always gotta be hustling. It's a hustler's job. You gotta, you know, take meetings and push and, and, and um, take the initiative. And yeah, so just, just things that are, that's it really, just developing and writing. Great. <laughs> Well, I want to thank you all for being here today. And, um, you know, I, um, hopefully in 2022, you guys can come and visit us at the festival um, live and in person, which would be great. Um, but, um, you know, we, this is this works, too. And uh, you've given so much great advice and um, really appreciate your time. And we hope to see you soon. Well, Thanks you for have having my us, Maddie. <laughs> <laughs> nice to meet you guys. Yeah, thank you. I'm glad. Yeah, you nice to meet you too. Yeah, we well, we've got a, a writer's uh, group. <laughs> That'd be yeah. fun. That'd be great, actually.